Thank you. Yahoy! My name is Selena Nader Glam, and I am from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Today I'll be performing a poem titled, I Grew Giant. And forgive me, but I'll be reading from my, po um, from my phone as I haven't memorized it yet. But Into the horizons we marched. Children with skinny, gangly limbs, each tiny step on the reef that comes out of hiding during low tide. A warrior determination our ancestors would have sang their praises for. For our home, for our country, us little warriors will save. Each of us with corals in our hands spread out into a long horizontal line. Our front to the roaring waves, our back to our lamoran, our land. We put the corals into the shallow water and we went to get more. Grow, little ones, grow corals. We tell them. We read that corals grew towards the sun. Grow, little ones, grow. Be the giant we need you to be. In the wildly adventurous minds of a child, they would grow to be giants, giant barriers for our home. Day after day, we would go to the ocean site, our horizon, check all the corals, have they grown? Little hands picking them up, hmm, this seems bigger. Yes, we are saved. Each year, we saw the corals less, the waves grew bigger. My uncle's house got torn down. They ran out with their screeching baby, their belongings swallowed by the ocean. The day our smiles cracked, our sea walls cracked. Savage down to broken pieces of hope and fear, our hope crumbled down with our fortress. Our fear rose with each rising wave, night after night with each high tide. But people forget the media turns a blind eye to that in a state of anger, fear, and panic. People act. We do not flee. We act. We will not flee. We will act. Because with each rising wave is our rising resilience and sense of justice and urgency for home, for us. Marshall Islands, the weeping home to 67 nuclear bombs. Marshall Islands, so damn strong. Absorbing each blow by blow by blow by blow by blow. Marshallese us learn to live, to live with the dire impacts. Our DNA riddled with poison to be passed on to our children and their children. Lands were lost, people never to return displaced. Marshall Islands home to a dome suffocating with nuclear waste that leaks day by day into the land to the rising water. But we lived. We are surviving. Most importantly, we stayed. We stayed. Let history repeat itself, pillaged by nature, angered by humanity's lack of morals, misplaced sense of responsibility, greed to take more than they deserve, you higher ups, blinded by your wants. Jimma told me, Selena, your needs will not last you, will last you a lifetime. Your wants will not. So tread carefully. No, it is not in 2040, 2050. No, yesterday's and today. Now is what I need you to respond to. I've seen bones of loved ones spilling out of broken graves, torn by angry waves. Nightmares haunt me at night and follows me throughout the day. The terror I feel, act now. I stand here, my chudagijin, for my people, my home, our corals never grew to be the giant we needed them to be, to protect us from the rising water, 
but I did, to 5-3. The giant to protect my home from the waves of deniers and work hand in hand with those fighting for our planet. Together with each of us, like the tiny corals my friends and I put out in a horizontal line near the outer reef, grow tall to stay, to be the giants for our planet. Como el tata, thank you. morning. What a powerful morning this has been. Please, let's give another round of applause for Selena Lamb. I noted this morning that Peter Lawhorn started us off talking about history, uh, and not just history of the recent past, but he mentioned that Los Angeles was continuously inhabited for thousands and thousands of years. We heard Sister Joan Chittister talk about her Benedictine monks, uh, the, an order that's been around more than 1,500 years. And I know little of the Marshall Ar Islands, Selena, but it, the, the little that I've read says that your people came there some 3,000 years ago. And we can hear from the poem the urgency in your voice. What is likely to happen, what's happening now, and what's likely to happen even in the next few years, given, given the trajectory we're on? So the Marshall Islands, for those who don't know, is we are located halfway between Hawaii and Australia. And most of the islands are approximately two meters above sea level. And even in many parts of the island, because it's a very skinny skeleton of islands, you can stand in the middle and you will see ocean water on both sides. There's the ocean side and there's the lagoon side. And so when we have our king tide season, so these are when the high tides are happening, the water would really go from the ocean side and rush through the land, go through the land and go to the lagoon side. And many parts of the island are even the size of this room. So from this end to that end, we have that. And so because of that, with, the cli with climate change happening, Marshall Islands is one of, the, one of the countries that are on the front line of this issue. And so our government and our people sees the urgency because climate change is a reality for us right now. It's very frustrating when I go to a lot of conferences and then people still talk about climate change as if it's a future, it's a thing that's going to happen in the future. Mm. And I'm like, no, <laughs> we're facing that right now. We don't have time for this crap. Get your act together. But it's very difficult because there's very few of us and with very limited resources and limited funding, most of the time I'm just the only Marshallese in the room or the only Islander in the room, and our voices get overshadowed or overwhelmed by the bigger voices. But it's very important, the urgency is there, the Marshall Island sees that, and that's why we use every means of capability that we have to go out and advocate and fight for our country. Well, you have two leaders in the climate fight on either side of you who have been pushing this message all over the world, even when it wasn't popular, even when it wasn't easy. Not that it's easy now. Christiana Figueres, you took on the role of leading the UN's climate convention, pushing for the world to get together on a deal when it was very, very challenging. And then you had this huge breakthrough in Paris in 2015. And there was a moment of real optimism. And I wonder, how do you assess the state of the fight today. Where are we now when it comes to the fight against global climate change? Well, where are we now? Um, l l let me answer that question from the point of view of reality and not from political myth. Uh, the reality is that, as Selena has told us, there is no such thing as climate change occurring either in the future or far away. Those two are absolutely non-truths. First, let me say very clearly that climate change happens absolutely 
in the Marshall Islands, in every single Pacific Island, and it also happens everywhere else in the world. There's no such thing as, okay, you know, the Marshall Islands may disappear, but everybody else is gonna be fine. Think about it, that we are all in one boat. And if there's a hole in the boat, there's no such thing as saying, it's only the ones that are close to the boat that are gonna drown. Everybody is in the same boat. And if there's a hole in the boat, the entire boat sinks. So that is something that we really have to get our heads around. This is something that is already affecting all of us, not only those on the front lines who are feeling it much more, but it is affecting all of us. Secondly, there is an urgency here that we have not understood. And let me be pollucidly clear. Unless we're able to address climate change, not over the next 20 to 30 to 40 years, in the decade between 2020 and 2030, unless we're able globally to reduce all greenhouse gases to one half of what we have now, we will enter into a environmental, social, political, and humanitarian crisis, the likes of which the world has never seen, and from which we will not be able to recuperate. So we can't play house anymore. We can't, you know, pretend like this is somebody's invention out there. We have a responsibility, every single adult alive today, every single adult has the responsibility to figure out what are we personally, what is our emission level, how are we gonna do it, and if you happen to be the mayor of a city, and we will hear from Eric in a minute, if you happen to be the CEO of a company, if you happen to be the mother in charge of your family, whatever your influence is, we have a huge and urgent responsibility. I cannot stress that enough. Honestly, we didn't know how urgent that was way back in 2015, but today the science is pollucidly clear. Pollucidly clear. It's happening everywhere, and if the Marshall Islands disappear, believe me, New York will disappear. Believe me, the coastal cities of the United States and of every other country will also disappear. This is not something to be exported either to other geographies or to other times. It is here and now, and we have to be able to address it. And we're going to get into solutions in a moment because there are some exciting things that are happening. There are exciting opportunities we have, but I do want to underline quickly before I go to the mayor, there are a couple of reports, Christiana, that just came out this year. One on biodiversity and the collapse of species and the other on this, this 1.5 report. Can you just very briefly, for those of us who may not be as tuned into the details around that, explain what, what is actually happening now? What did those two reports reveal to us about the current reality? In 2015, on, with, without those two reports, we thought we had some time and we thought the effects were not gonna be so dire. Today, what we know is that if we continue as we are right now, if we all continue to drive the way we're driving and you know, eat the way we're eating and invest the way we're investing and do the corporate decisions the way we are, then we're going to go into a world um, that um, has a destruction of infrastructure that, uh, has, that renders the entire equatorial belt completely uninhabitable where just think of the 200 million people who live in that equatorial belt will no longer be able to live there. So they will push north and they will push south. We will have a humanitarian crisis that is unstoppable because we will get into a domino effect of cons consistently more infrastructure damage, less food security, less water security, less home security. I, I, I mean, I just, it, it, is un, uh, it is unfathomable to me that we have this information um, and we just continue business as usual. We have the the good news is there's a lot going on, right? There is, and I, I want to get to that. In fact, the award winner today is an organization that, apropos of this discussion, works on 
one of the most important humanitarian issues in the world, which is refugees. And the refugee crisis everywhere, including in places like Los Angeles and all over the world, we have refugee numbers rising. Uh, and there are reports that the, the coffee farmers of Central America and the, and the, and the lack of uh, productivity of their farms is a big reason for the migration of people from Central America here. The Lake Chad region, home to 40 million people, the, the lake is shrunk by 90%. So the, these crises, as you say, are truly global, very severe in places like the Marshall Islands, but truly affecting everywhere. And cities are often on the front lines of this. And, and Mayor, you have not only focused on the work within Los Angeles, but you now, as, as the incoming chair of C40, this coalition of cities, are really pushing an agenda for cities to continue to take the lead. And that's where a lot of the solutions are coming from. So give us some, a sense of what the opportunity is, even given this urgency. Well, thank you, Raj, and, and thank you to the Hilton Foundation, to Peter and Steve, and to everybody for hosting again, and um, our thoughts, obviously, with the entire family on the passing of Baron and, and the amazing work you did to establish this foundation, and the work that you have collectively done to stitch together at the most local level, whether it's homelessness or the most global level, uh, with the humanitarian prize, the work that is before us. Um, let me inject a note of hope, because I couldn't get on with my day if I didn't have some hope in the midst of this. I just com came back from Copenhagen where um, Mayor Hidalgo of Paris, who's been our chair for the last three years, handed me the baton. And let me mirror some of what was said. The 2020s I described in my incoming speech there has to be the climate decade. It has to be the decade of action. It is the most important decade in human history. But I was there with the 94 megacities that comprise C40. Don't ask me why C40 has 94 cities now. But <laughs> once you get a name, you have a name. It's a good problem to have. It is a good problem. Um, and we comprise 25% of the world's GDP. Because often we focus at the national level. And the national level is absolutely critical. And it's wonderful when you have national leaders who are in sync with you. But as I remind people, whether it was President Trump or President Hillary Clinton, most of the work in America is done at the local level anyway. Building codes, transportation, electricity generation, the things that we have to do rest in local communities. They can't be just implemented or mandated from the federal level and even at the national level when they are not cooperating with us, like our administration trying to literally shove higher pollution standards down our throats here in California. We don't have to uh, be powerless, and I refuse to be. We announced in Copenhagen that 30 of the mega cities have already peaked and are coming down in our emissions. So for those who think that this isn't possible to do, I would say it absolutely is. And two things. We announced a global Green New Deal, the concept that has been out there for a while at the local level, which we've released here in Los Angeles. 61 uh, commitments in 14 different categories from zero emission buildings to zero emission transportation to zero emission um, uh, electricity generation to 100% water recycling to 100% um, uh, recycling of our goods. Those five pillars, easy to say but difficult to do. There's an interesting thing about this problem. This problem gets cheaper and easier to solve the longer it has been going on. Most problems are the opposite. The longer you wait, the more expensive it is. And yet, two years ago, if you had told me, I would be able to green light the largest solar production and storage deal in US history and the second cheapest in world history, and that it would be half the price for that solar generation as it was for natural gas, which is at record lows or has been, I wouldn't have believed you, let alone a decade ago where people would have said, okay, we all made the argument as environmentalists, the long-term costs are greater than the short-term savings. Now it's actually the short-term savings and the long-term savings are in solar, are in wind, are in changing these things immediately. So the technology, the political will is growing. You see cities that are doing this. In a single year in Los Angeles, we reduced our emissions by 11%. That same year, our unemployment went down 14%. So the last point I'd make is the idea of a global Green New Deal takes the two anxieties that human beings face right now. Will the world be around as you know it? Will my home, will my civilization, will my social structures be around because of global climate change? And if it is around, is there a place in this quickly changing economy for me and my children? Will there actually be, in the face of automation and technology, a middle class, any prosperity in this world? And by combining those two things together like we've done here in LA, we've added 35,000 jobs in six years in green sector in a city of four million people. That's nearly one in a hundred people just in six years. Or to put it that comparison, that's 60% of the remaining coal jobs across America. So my message to mayors is get with it for your economy, get with it for your people, get with it to save your city, 
And we can't do this without the Marshall Islands. Marshall Islands can't do this without LA. That's why we have to have this global network to do this work so that we all save our communities together. Being in the news business, please applaud that. <laughs> applaud that. <laughs> Being in the news business, I know how hard it is to get positive headlines through sometimes or important headlines through. So I just want to underline what the mayor just said earlier on in his remarks. This uh, Copenhagen meeting you referred to, yep. uh, which had a big announcement, was just a few days ago, October 9th, Correct. I think, right? Um, and the, the announcement there was 30 mega cities have reached peak emissions and are coming down. Yes. This is a remarkable headline. So if this has not made it through to your news feed, make sure you know it. it it's an important one to spread that there is such tremendous opportunity. And this is a room of humanitarians. This is yes. a conference about humanitarianism. Yep. Help us think about the connection points. We talked about refugees, but what, what is the connection? Why should people who care about the future of humanity think of themselves now as climate warriors in the way that, Selena, you talk about yourself? How do we make that connection more strong and fertile going forward? Oh, that's easy because we're currently choosing between two futures, and the choice will be made irreversibly by 2030. But as the mayor has said, it's, it's going to be very, very close. We really are, you know, like this much from a closed door, but we can still do it, right? Um, and the irony about climate change is that we can either do nothing and condemn ourselves to a horrible world, condemn future generations to a horrible world, or we can decide that we are going to recreate the world as we know it. Because we have the technologies, the technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper. They're easier to access. We, they're easier to, uh, to be deployed around the world. They are uh, getting, as I say, cheaper and cheaper so that from a financial point of view, there is much more of an incentive to use these technologies. Oh, these are things like batteries, storage, batteries, ba batteries, renewable energy, energy efficiency. Um, electric vehicles are currently still more expensive, but will come down as well. Um, and all of these technologies and all of these practices and the policies that support them actually collectively build a much better world. And they are the better investment. That's the interesting thing which is why just a month ago we had an alliance of asset owners who decided, $2.4 trillion among them, who decided they are going to switch over their investment portfolios to only companies that are actually Paris aligned, Paris climate aligned. Um, because they know that if they align themselves with a, decarbon a steep decarbonization, which is what Paris um, demands, then they actually have asset value that is not going to be privy to short-term and particularly long-term risk of high carbon assets. They're moving over to low carbon or no carbon assets that have a much longer lifeline and are only growing in value. And so, you know, th that's the thing that is so difficult to understand. We are being faced with a disastrous world and a fantastic world. And all we have to do is choose. But we have to choose intentionally, just like the C40 cities have chosen. They know what is best for their cities, what is best for their citizens. But we have to make that choice. It can't be, and, and here's the trick. Not choosing means we're into the default path of a disastrous world. That's the trick. We have to choose. We have to make the decisions. We have to make those investments. We have to change those behaviors um, that we have had. And then we can create so much of a better world. It seems like this climate challenge is overlaid on top of an existing set of inequalities in the world. When we talk about the migration challenges, where are people coming from? Often from countries that already face conflict, where the annual per capita income is already very low, where people don't have access to, to basic medicine. And I wonder how you think about this challenge, because there is tremendous technological opportunity. But as I mentioned before, you've got places like the Lake Chad region, which are very arid. The lake is shrinking dramatically, nomadic tribes living there. And these are some of the places you just mentioned before where you're going to see dramatic migration coming from. You have countries like the Philippines, 100 million people. Half their diet is dependent on fish, and fish stocks are starting to collapse there. So when you think of the inequalities in the world that we're in today, 
and you they can be solved by addressing the, climate change. Th That's listen. the fun thing. Oh, it is so fun. Okay, so a, a couple of you know really good examples. We have 800 million people around the world who today, in 2019, have no electricity. That is just unacceptable, right? Why? Because the fossil fuel industry has insisted that they are the only solution to that. Wrong. Because those 800 million people around the world, who are clearly the poorest people around the world, can be electrified with renewable energy, with a little solar panel, a little mini grid, and they can have electricity. Mo the moment those people have electricity, their quality of life begins to go up. We have about the same number of people who are in extreme poverty around water and around, uh, and around food. We can restore those degraded lands so that they can actually have water and food, and that, that addresses climate change. Putting little solar panels for those uh, other people helps with climate change. So we can have a regeneration. That's what we, what we really uh, can have here. We can have a re regeneration that minimizes humanitarian crises and strengthens, in particular, those people who are the most vulnerable at the bottom of that pyramid, in particular, who are the ones who really need the most help. But we can do it and address climate change at the same, at the same time. So we, we get a double whammy. Why are we not doing it? I, I want to get your take on this too, Mayor, because you've done something interesting as a mayor of a major city, which is mm -hmm. said, I'm going to use the sustainable development goals mm -hmm. as kind of a frame for determining how you advance the opportunities and equality for people in this city. How do you think about those goals and the development and humanitarian agenda mm -hmm. and the climate one, as Christiana just described? Well, well, thanks to the Hilton Foundation, we're the first uh, city in the world to actually not only uh, um, hold ourselves accountable to the sustainable development goals, which uh, a few handfuls of other cities have globally, but we have an open and accountable portal where we're sharing that data and measuring it now. Because we do see the intersection of all of these things. How can you fight for climate if you're not fighting, fighting for gender equality? How can you fight for um, uh, economic opportunity or deal with food, as you said, without looking at climate? Um, how can we develop almost any policy around anything if we don't tie these things together? And it was remarkable to see how many people were wearing, maybe it's just because it's a beautiful pin, but the Sustainable Development Goals pin when I was there, C40, mayors from around the world. Uh, really, it was kind of like a flag that united us, even much more than the United Nations flag has ever done. Because what each one of those colors in the Sustainable Development Goals said is it really comes down to people. It's very humanistic. And I think what loses people is climate change is so big and it's often so statistical. We get into CO2 tons and we talk about 1.5. And even though we might understand that, we, we really have to translate it to human terms. Mm -hmm. We have to translate it to our lives, to our neighborhoods. I always say here, who cares how many miles of roads I can pave if Venice is underwater? Who cares how ma many resources I've added to our fire department if they're always out fighting a fire? And to your point, when you're saying that we're the front line, I was literally in Copenhagen and uh, Secretary General Guterres was speaking to us at the plenary session saying that cities are the first uh, responders, fires, floods, when someone tapped on my shoulder and said, you got to get on a plane in two hours because there's a fire that's breaking out here in Los Angeles and we saw the fires this past weekend. F a fire that moved, by the way, every two and a half seconds, one acre. So you have to bring it down to what people care about and know about and I think the sustainable development goals are those. It's the best articulation of things we've always been fighting for in development and human rights, um, in environmental work. But there's something much more humanistic. It, it speaks to people how they live, where we sleep, what we eat, the relations we have between each other. And as such, a lot of people said, well, how's a mayor going to talk about UN stuff to his people of four million? And I think people get them in a, very, in a much more visceral level than we even talk about our national programs here in the United States. And so I'm hoping to be able to spread that gospel to other mayors to say, look, this is how we can tie these things together, because otherwise, this is just an overwhelming moment for us to lead. You know, I know you talk uh, about optimism. I love that, you, you know, that's the name now of, of your organization, um, but people are pretty depressed out there. You talk to a young person, and the way, the way some of us grew up with nuclear war being the great threat, you know, that, oh my gosh, somebody would press a button, the world could get destroyed. There is a feeling it will be destroyed, and there is a ton of trauma in our young people globally right now, mm -hmm. but this is the hope to say there are goals, we can meet those goals, and then to show those successes. If we don't highlight those, um, people will, you will see a nihilism out there that itself will generate some of the suffering that we hope to avoid. It does feel like 2019 is a different moment 
and maybe it's partly the reports that have come out, the scientific basis for this, the conversation seems to have moved in a way, and a lot of it does have to do with young people, right? I mean, there are young people in the streets in so many parts of the world protesting around these issues, and young leaders like you, Selena, who are saying, you know what, I'm gonna find a stage somewhere to make this point because there's real urgency. So I wonder if, if you agree with this. Do, does it feel like 2019 is a different moment? Does it feel like things have shifted in some sense? And where do young people fit into that? I'd love to get your take, Selena, but everybody on the panel. So obviously it's all over the media with Greta and um, Kathy Kutinel and Brianna, like all these other activists that are doing all these climate strikes and also bringing up the use of art in order to communicate what we youths are going through, the trauma that we're experiencing now due to climate change. It's become the thing now. And I, I just find it very sad because again, like from the Marshall Islands, the situation is very dire for us. And it's great, but at the same time, I am also feeling like this should have happened way back. Mm. It should have happened years ago. But then it comes down to the responsibility of the media and the, the, all these higher ups and the control that they have on the news that are going out. But because of these individuals that just decided to do something and it blew up, everything blew, blew up and people are just catching it, the, the media is taking attention of it and they're putting it out there. And media just really is a powerful tool and they really need to take their responsibility seriously and bring the message out there. If Greta hadn't done that strike and media hadn't turned to that, then where would we be right now? So again, it's the individual's actions and the media really is a key thing that brings the message out to the world and really brings us all together. So it just, um, things are just really, it's like, it's better than nothing. I, I don't have the privilege of saying, hey, we should have done this way. I mean, I'm saying it now, but this and is- And you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, we can <laughs> <have> to <laughs> but yeah, we should totally have right. right. Um, I have a podcast called Outrage and Optimism because um, I think those are the two sentiments that are moving us and right in front of us. There is outrage on the streets. I feel the outrage. I'm sure the mayor feels the outrage. Selena, you've heard her beautiful poetic outrage. And that we have to give space to that outrage because the fact is we have delayed way too long. And we have to stand up to say, yes, we have been irresponsible. Every single one of us has been irresponsible. So we cannot deny the outrage. We cannot deny the anger on the streets. And at the same time, if we allow that outrage and that despair to have us fall into a, the box of paralysis, then we have done nothing. Then we really condemn ourselves to that world that we don't want. So we have to be able to garner and harvest that outrage and that anger and transform it into an optimism that is not a naive optimism. For me, optimism is not the result of some success, that's a celebration. Optimism is the gritty determination that we have to use to face climate change to say, yes, it is absolutely dire what we have right now. And here is what we're already doing about it. And we will be able not to solve climate change because we're too late for that, but we will be able to bring climate change effects to a manageable level, and let's be clear about that, a manageable level for all human beings on this planet. So optimism has, has to be there because it is, it, it is what propels us forward. It's also what gets me up in the morning yeah. to say, yes, we can do this, we have to do this. It's a gritty, stubborn optimism that we all have to share. Um, it's not, it, but, but we have to be able to manage both sentiments, right? It's that outrage and the optimism, and both together are actually quite powerful. And I wonder if you think young people are managing that. I know you just created a mayor's council yes. on climate. T talk, to, uh, talk to us about why you did that and what you're hearing from the young people on that council. So, so Victor and Brianna were two of the members. I, I'm a big fan of youth empowerment, not uh, pat on the head, check box off youth empowerment, but. I have a, a youth council for the entire city. I formed one on gun violence, which has launched an incredible campaign to reduce gun violence. And then we just formed one on climate, the climate emergency. 
and these are advisors to me. They're not like a group that meets with themselves and decides what they can do in their schools. They're advising directly the mayor, city council, and our city departments on the actions we need to take to save their lives and our earth. Um, so Brianna and Victor, Victor who lost, who grows up, uh, grew up in Wilmington, which is the area near the port of Los Angeles. L LA is the densest hydrocarbon location in the world and has the third largest oil field in America underneath us. Uh, we have many oil fields, but the third largest is underneath us. There's a bigger one in Alaska, a bigger one in Texas. People don't live on top of those here. People actually live on top of it. And he lost his father to lung cancer. So he's part of that front line of the disempowered, poorer communities, often communities of color, that bear the brunt of all of our failures. People are dying today and have died. And to, for him to be able to be there at a table with um, folks who have founded Zero Hour and uh, you know, from Africa, Latin America, uh, you know, we had people from basically every continent inhabited Earth, and then for them to take the street, AOC came to uh, uh, Copenhagen as well and joined us for C40, and to have, you know, when Mike Bloomberg and AOC are both fighting on the same stage together, that's a pretty amazing coalition that is beginning to coalesce. And what I told the young people is, I'm ready to follow. Leadership is about learning how to follow as much as it is about learning how to lead. And they're crystal clear, they're empowered, they're ready to act, and they're demanding things happen today. They say if Shenzhen electrified its entire bus fleet now, 100%, 16,000 buses in three or four years, why are we waiting till 2030? Which is ambitious feeling for us. <laughs> and I say, you're darn right. 2030 is the promise I made last year, but maybe this year we can shave another year and another year and another year till we come in four or five years earlier than we thought. This is about will. And don't tell me that human beings who fought world wars, stubborn human beings who love to survive at our core, can't do this. And in fact, the excitement, it's funny how you have the, your two words, I, I talk about this as being the age of anxiety. It's the anxiety and the excitement together. And if we can channel that, that feeling of, of excitement that this is our battle to fight and to win, mm -hmm. I think young people can change that outrage and that depression and that trauma into the excitement of what the purpose of their lives mm -hmm. is. And if we have them behind us, because those young people are about to run the world, I think we're gonna be okay. And it seems like what C40 is showing us is there are many places to have this fight, right? We obviously see it in the media and we see it Everywhere. in national politics, but there are many venues, especially at the local level, especially yeah. at the community level. Right. You know, obviously we're here in Los Angeles and this is a august occasion, but no matter where you are in the world, whatever your small community is, there's a place to do this. And I wonder how you think about that idea of protest, of civil disobedience, of organizing, of pushing and innovating, and how we can make it a, glo a truly global movement. And, and it, maybe it's becoming one already here in 2019, but how do you see that? Selena and others. Well, 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 five seconds. We have to train and give young people the tools to go from the street to inside. You know, I've seen some amazing social uh, movements, Black Lives Matter, Time's Up, uh, racial and gender equality. And I want to make sure all this momentum doesn't just stay on the street. I, want it to, I do want it to stay on the street, but I also mm -hmm. want people not to just feel pure on the street. They need to cross into city halls. They need to cross into boardrooms. And I am committed to empowering young people to learning the skills to be both an inside and outside strategist. In the Pacific, um, things are a bit different. We don't normally do strikes. We, um, because again, it's the culture and there's a lot of things, there's a lot of barriers that come into that and we're just not the type to just go out on the street and do the strike and then something will happen. Usually we just communicate with our elders and such and so it works in other parts of the world and again, whatever works, use it, do it because it's very, we're a very diverse world and we can't expect one solution to be working everywhere. So whatever means you have, whatever things that are happening and it's effective in your place, then go out and do it while we do our part in the Pacific and also try to get our voices out there so that it's balanced. It's not just the global north, but it's also the global south that are involved in this discussion as most of us, the very vulnerable and, and people on the front line, we are getting it right now. And it's very important that our message is carried forth as well. And the Pacific Islands, most of them, and I'm sorry, Selena, I'm, I'm not sure if the Marshall Islands is on the list of, of islands that I'm thinking of, but most of them, probably including Marshall, 
have either already committed to or are already 100% renewable. Um, and the reason for that is, yes, of course, they want to stand up as an example to all the rest of us who are laggards, but there is another very important reason, and that is, think about it. Think where the Pacific Islands are located. So for the Pacific Islands to import fossil fuels from wherever they're being produced, transport them all the way to the island. Do you know how expensive those fossil fuels are by the time they reach the islands? Most of those Pacific islands have to, or had to, because most of them have changed away from it now, were using 25 to 30 percent of the national budget just to buy fuel, let alone housing, education, health, all the rest that, um, that they have to take care of. And do you know what is the most preponderant element upon all of the Pacific Islands? The sun. And so they've moved to renewable energy, right? Because it's cheaper for them. It's healthier for them. Their air is better. It's cheaper for them. Now they can use that 28 or 30% or of their national budget for other things that have to do with the SDGs. So we have to, add, and they're being a fantastic example for us, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that addressing climate change has so many benefits, so many benefits. In many cases, it's simply cheaper, it's a better investment, it's healthier, and it's definitely creating a better world. Mm -hmm. Just as we wrap up and leave you, I, I wonder what all of you would say to the humanitarian community. I mean, this is a community, many people here have been working for decades. This prize has been around for decades. The foundation has been around for decades, working on issues of humanitarianism before we even heard the words climate change. What should we as a community be taking forward now? What can we be doing differently as we go into a potentially scary, outrageous, difficult, challenging new future, but also one filled with the opportunities you've all described? I would say imagine that we suddenly were at a, in a world war. How would that change your thinking? As a company, as an organization, family, a neighborhood, H how would it literally, how would it change if we suddenly it was World War III or World War II again? And if we don't across every single category of government, humanitarian organizations, businesses, don't make this decade the climate decade, it doesn't matter who we're giving prizes to. It doesn't matter what programs I have. It doesn't matter what profits you're making. It literally doesn't matter. And there are moments in human history, and it's usually easier when it's a much more recognizable threat that's in front of you, somebody with a gun, planes flying overhead, ships that are threatening you. But I don't overstate this threat to say that's what this decade will be. Yeah. It's where we started, it's where I think we should end, and it's just a moment. It's not to be the bad news guy, it's to take a moment and really assess your organization for a decade period, because everything we want to do after that decade depends on whether we will meet this one challenge this decade with concrete action, not commitments, not plans, but the implementation decade, this climate decade of the 2020s, that's what I would say. Please remember my face. Remember this face? This is a resilient face. This is a Marshallese face from the people who are affected hugely by climate change. Everywhere you go, the actions you do affect myself, my people, and the acts you do, it's not just I who's watching you, it's also the youth all over the world. That's my message. Mm -hmm. So to everyone, So to anyone who says climate is not important, or climate is too complicated, or it's too expensive, or it's too far away, or it doesn't have anything to do with me, knock them down, because all of that isn't true. Uh, and we have to be able to solve this, and the only way to do it is to have that gritty, stubborn optimism that is gonna get us through. And so to remind the three of you of that, I have t-shirts for the three of you. Nice. <laughs> Mayor, this is yours. Awesome. I love it. Selena. Thank you. And Raj. We will wear these proudly. Yes. Thank you. But Thank don't you. just wear them. Do it. This is our new band. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.
Let me just say that one of the reasons why this day and this prize is so inspirational to me and I think to so many of you is the idea that shortly we'll see about an organization that gets up on stage and we'll hear about these kind of insurmountable odds. And you'll see that a small group of people getting together who are committed, who are optimistic, can actually do it. And this session is, is about impossibility, is just an attitude, right? And, and I think there are so many examples, the leadership of these three incredible people can give us about what's actually possible, what we can do in this era. I was listening to Sister Joan Chittister say what humanitarianism really is. It is this fundamental idea that we are all people, that this is one yeah. common earth, yeah. and that the problems of anyone, wherever they are, are my problems too, right. right? And that is fundamentally what this community is all about and what this prize is all about. So it is an honor, I think, for all of us to be part of this movement to seek higher ground. So thank you to the Hilton Foundation. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to our prize winner. And thank you to this panel.